they claim that our eyes were just to be created a slightly different from what they are when we talk we see things in our Hey, Allison. Yes. Welcome to Strange Familiars. Oh, thanks. And to all of our listening audience as well, welcome to Strange Familiars. How are you doing tonight, Allison? I'm doing well. On tonight's show, I'm going to be talking with Mr. Lon Strickler, who is an author and a podcaster. And Lon, maybe most famous for the Phantoms and Monsters blog. Phantoms and Monsters has been around forever. And when I started getting into the weird stuff, or I guess when I started getting into it again, post-internet, Phantoms and Monsters was one of my go-to places every day. Phantoms and Monsters, Phantoms and Monsters. Still is. All kinds of weird stuff there. It's a collection of ghosts and cryptids and UFOs and you name it. When I started writing books and doing the podcast, I reached out to Lon and he was a help right away. He's been a help all along the way to me, so... Uh, happy to have Lon on the show. He was on our very first episode, way, way back, episode one. Talking about Ray Myers Hollow? I don't even yeah. remember. Yeah, he told his Ray Myers Hollow story. He tells it again tonight since it's been hundreds of episodes. <laughs> so yeah, I just had his, him tell it again. His family must be somehow related to the Ray Myers family because his last name is one of the roads in Ray Myers Hollow, right? Is there Strickler Road in Ray Myers Hollow? Brill Strick Road. It's uh, ah. Brill Hart and Strickler. So, oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised. He's got ties to the area for He's sure. He's probably related to me, too. I think we figured it out. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he is. <laughs> Stay tuned after my talk with Lon. We're going to have a little discussion about my new podcast, The Flowered Path. Before I get to my conversation with Lon, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thank you so much, patrons. We could not make Strange Familiars without you. If you like what we do here at Strange Familiars... And you want to help us out and get extra content besides, you can go to patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. There's different tiers of support there, and you can choose to be billed monthly or yearly. No matter what tier of support you choose, no matter how you choose to be billed, you're helping us make Strange Familiars. It's a huge help. And our patrons get two full extra episodes of Strange Familiars every month exclusively for our patrons. Last month, they got three, because Halloween. When we can, we throw in even more content. Again, it's patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. So for my conversation with Lon, I kind of just had him go over all of his personal experiences. He's written books about various topics, including winged humanoids and so forth, but because it's strange familiars, and because Lon has a considerable amount of personal experience with this strange stuff, including Bigfoot and some kind of winged entity, maybe Mothman, maybe something else, and some ghostly encounters. I wanted to talk to Lon about his personal encounters. So let's go ahead and get to my conversation with Lon. I'd like to welcome Lon Strickler to the show. How are you doing tonight, Lon? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, Tim. Oh, I'm so glad to have you back. For those who don't know, Lon is an author. He runs the Phantom and Monsters website, which is, I mean, how long has Phantoms and Monsters been going? 17 years. Wow. Wow. And I always tell people that you have been kind of like a mentor to me when I got started. You were very helpful with me, always giving me advice and somebody I trust and I go to uh, when I have questions about this stuff. And I've had a few, you know, people with kind of extreme hauntings, we'll say, uh, mm -hmm. that I've, I've had to come to you for advice for. We work together in the Phantoms and Monsters investigation. Mm -hmm. And Lon has, well, you have four books out right now. Mm -hmm. And they're all through uh, Into the Fray Publishing, right? Yeah, Beyond the Fray Publishing. Or Beyond the Fray, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Shannon does both. I get confused sometimes. <laughs> Beyond <laughs> yeah, the Fray Publishing. Yeah. And, you know, uh, recently, one of my listeners, Steve from York, said, Hey, Tim, have you ever had Lon on the show? And I, I said, Yeah. 
way back on episode one. <laughs> and you told uh, your Hex Hollow story for me back then. I thought, you know what? I need to fix that. That's been way too long. Oh, my God. It's been that long? Yeah. yeah. That's so, hard to believe. Yeah, 340-some yeah. episodes later, here we are. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've had you on my show three or four times since then. Yeah, yeah. I just, this time flies and then you yeah. know, one thing after this. So thanks, Steve, for reminding me. And now we have Lon on it. And I'm really excited because I talked to you like only about the Hex Hollow stuff because that's what that episode was about. But I know you have these other experiences and I'd mm -hmm. love to just kind of do a, a general survey of some of your experiences you've had. What was the earliest thing you had that kind of woke you up to this world of the other or the supernatural? You know, I was about nine or 10 and it happened on the Gettysburg Battlefield. I'm a history nerd anyway, and I spent a lot of time out there on the battlefield when I was a kid. Now, this is like 1968, 69, something like that. So uh, I used to pedal my bike up 116 and, <laughs> and go to Gettysburg. I was living in Hanover back then. Yeah, I used to spend time on the battlefield. And, you know, it was a summer day. I was over in the... Uh, uh, the Valley of Death area, which is between Little Round Top, Devil's Den, the wheat field. Mm -hmm. You know, it was pretty active on the second day of the battle. So, you know, I, I never really had much of a sense of anything before that. I was just fascinated. I, honestly, I was just fascinated going there and seeing all the people there and stuff, you know. Was, but I had never had an encounter before. So um, this one day in particular, and I think it was either in July or August, you know, I know it wasn't the week of the actual anniversary because it would have been crowded with people, but right. it wasn't, it wasn't as crowded. I was on the uh, access road going past the wheat field and all of a sudden it's like a TV screen opened up in front of me. It was bizarre. I didn't know what the hell it was. And I was there. I was at the battle. I was seeing soldiers, hearing gunfire, gun, you know, screams, yells, smelling gunpowder. I mean, it was like all my senses had been opened up and heightened. Wow. And that lasted for like 30 seconds, I believe. And then it just quit. And, you know, I'm on my bike. I'm standing here on my bike like, what the hell was this? I don't know what that was. But that was real, the, really the first time I realized I could connect. And to be quite honest with you, I... I knew something was going on before that, but I couldn't put my finger on it. You know, I didn't live in a haunted house or things like that, but I would have strange dreams or strange senses when I was younger, especially at night. But, you know, after that occurred, I, I kind of opened myself up to it. Hmm. And, you know, as time went on, I started starting sensing things, I started really learning to tell when I was around spirit energy. And it's unusual for me because I can actually see colors in my mind's eye when spirit energy is around. Oh, that's interesting. It's like a, a pinkish green foam combination of colors that appear in my mind's eye. It's, now, it's weird. Is that something that developed over time? Yeah, it yeah. did. Yeah. Wow. I didn't understand it. But as time went by and, you know, being out in the battlefield all the time, I used to go out there all the time. Even when I you know, got to teenage years, I went out there, you know, about my senior year of high school. That was about the time I was really getting into looking into um, some of the paranormal history of Adams in York County. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know about the uh, me and the. Uh, uh, Hex Hollow area, and I, I saw something out there one day that would just totally flipped me out. Well, since it's been so many episodes, we might as well you know go over that well, again. Okay, you know, at the time, I don't know if you remember what the place was like back in the well, you, you, I don't even know when you were born, but back in the, the mid 70s, there was an access road, an old dirt access road that went back to the house. There was kind of a half ass gate there. Mm -hmm. I had never been there before, so I, I drove up. You know, I knew a bit about powwowing and stuff, and honestly, I, I kept <laughs> I kept a long-lost friend with me a lot. Mm -hmm. 
And I had had the relatives talk to me and tell me about powwowing. I, I never really went through any of the training or anything. But, I, you know, I was very familiar with it. Well, anyway, of course, when you're talking about powwowing in York County, of course, the, the Raymar case comes up. And, you know, I read Hex and, you know, all the, uh, the news clippings and everything about the trial and the murder. But anyway, I drove up to the, um, to the small gate they had across the road. And I stopped my car, and I got out, and I started walking a bit up the road. And as I was walking, I was maybe about 50, 60 yards away from the house, and I saw a guy standing on the road. And he was walking around and looking down on the ground, you know, just kind of meandering around. I, you know, so I didn't know who he was, but, you know, I, I wanted to get out there and look around and I, I thought well maybe this guy is a caretaker or something so I yelled at him I said hey how you doing and he didn't respond to me so I walked up a little more and I yelled at again and he looked up and I'll never forget it this guy had no face literally had no face I remember the story from when you told me before and I still got chills when you said that <laughs> And you've been out there, so you know how weird the place is. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, he had no face, and I just freaked. I ran back to my car and got out of there. Yeah, that was kind of uh, <laughs> that was kind of a shocking development. I, I'll be honest with you, that kind of the first time that any, or maybe the, the only time since that any apparition has really kind of startled me. I don't even know if it was an apparition. It looked real. I mean, it, it looked like a full body. But uh, I don't know what the hell that was. You know, it was a Ray Meyer. I don't know. Right. I don't know who it was. The thing about that is that people don't realize because it's so easy. You can find the house on maps. And back then, you, you even even into the 90s, even the early 2000s, you had to know where it was. Exactly. You had to know somebody who knew, basically. Yeah, it was all grown up. I mean, the, the large fields in front of the place which are kept tidy now. And the road and the woods area, that was all grown up. Mm -hmm. And the house was kind of dilapidated anyway, from what I could tell back then. It was kind of a mess back there. But, yeah, that kind of uh, that kind of surprised me. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I didn't really see, you know, honestly, I didn't really ever say much to my parents about any of this stuff. I don't even know if they ever thought I had abilities like this. I, I never talked to them about it. No, I mean, they eventually found out after seeing what I was, was doing and hearing about it on the Internet or on TV or something. But other than that, they would, you know, they never really knew much about it. And I kind of kept it quiet. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of did the same. I, did, I First of all, I had, you know, uh, four brothers and a sister and they would have mercilessly made fun of me, <laughs> you know, for, for any of that being the youngest Secondly, you know, it wasn't something you talked to your parents about, I guess. I don't know. Now, you, you know. Well, you know how conservative this area is. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, you and I live, well, you were living down in Maryland back then, but, you know, this whole area is somewhat conservative. Yeah, yeah. You know, I call it the Bible Belt of Pennsylvania because it is, <laughs> it really is. I mean, you know. I always called it the suspenders on the Bible Belt. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, people just don't talk about a lot of stuff. And, you know, it's like when I go into an investigation or, you know, if I get a cryptic encounter or sighting and, uh, you know, I try to talk to people, it's like they look at you like you're really, really nuts even now. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, after I had graduated from high school, I moved down to Maryland and I was living in Sykesville. You know, I was working and I had a family and. You know, honestly, the, the thing that really kept me busy back then was, you know, I would do a few, I would do a few investigations. It was the word of mouth thing back then. You know, if somebody in Pennsylvania had a case or something, I'd drive up there and look into it. Or even in Maryland, I did a few cases. But that was the extent of it. It was just hauntings and unexplained activity. Mm -hmm. I used to do a lot of fishing. I used to do a lot of fly fishing. I used to drive up to Cumberland County and out into the me show and all there and you still do a lot of fishing up here in pennsylvania but i used to fish down in the rivers and streams in maryland as well so one day i was may 9th 1981 i was down at the um south branch of patapsco river which is about a mile 
downstream from Route 32 in Sykesville. And it's an area I used to fish all the time. I used to go down there for red eye and smallmouth. I was actually in the river. And it's, in that area right there, it's not really large. It's, it's more like a stream as opposed to a river. I was in my waders. I was uh, in the water. I was just you know, throwing my fly out there here and there. And, you know, but it was a beautiful day. It was very clear, nice and sunny, kind of warm. And I noticed a stray dog on the uh, Carroll County side of the river uh, on the bank. It was, you know, he was just walking around and stuff. And then I, um, you know, didn't pay him any mind. So I just went back to fishing. But then I heard a yelp. Then I looked up and looked over. And when I looked, there was a real large patch of tall weeds over there. And something stood up in the weeds. And this thing was, it was, it was huge. You know, I later estimated between seven and a half and eight foot. Now the weeds kind of covered it from maybe mid torso down. But when it stood up and I could see it, it was definitely covered in hair. And I didn't know what to think. You know, I had heard of Bigfoot, but you know, with the, um, the Boggy Creek thing and all that, you knew, you know, you knew of Bigfoot. Right. But I never really thought much about it. Sure, I used to watch In Search Of and all that other stuff. But I never really thought much about it investigating cryptids. But anyway, this thing, I'm standing there in the water with my, my jaw down in the water. <laughs> and I'm looking at this thing, and it, it, it walked to my left and walked out of the weeds and then when it came out right on the edge of the water, it stopped, turned, and was standing there looking at me. Oh, my goodness. And I was about 40 to 50 foot away from it. That's close. That was close. And this thing was huge. It was dark brownish hair, matted in some places. Uh, like I said, it was about seven and a half to eight foot in height. Very broad shoulders, very thick. It had a, con a slightly conical head, but the one thing it, that impressed me about it was it looked human. I mean, the face didn't look as much ape-like as opposed to like a Neanderthal or what they would, you, you know, we'd see pictures of a Neanderthal. Right, yeah, yeah. And it was definitely male because I could see the genitalia on this thing, but it was, uh, it was making a clicking sound. It was weird. You know, as time went on and as I d did some investigating, I, I believe it was like a nervous ticking sound or something that it maybe it's how it reacted to seeing something it just didn't really recognize or I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it was making this ticking sound. I did kind of get a, a bit of a whiff of an odor that honestly, it reminded me of fox urine. Hmm. Uh, I used to use a lot of fox urine when I used to go deer hunting. I used to put a mask on my boots. Yeah, that's what it reminded me of. So, you know, we're we're standing there looking at each other. We lock eyes for like 10 seconds. You know, I don't know what the hell I'm looking at, but then it turns and just quickly runs up into the woods. It doesn't run. It walks swiftly up into the woods. So, you know, I'm thunderstruck right there. I'm, I have no idea what I'm looking. I'm thinking, well, maybe this was a Bigfoot. But, you know, you know, you got Springfield State Hospital, which isn't really far away from there. I'm thinking, well, maybe something escaped from there. Wow. Maybe somebody escaped from there. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I immediately got my gear, went up into uh, up on the road and got in my car and drove into Sykesville. Didn't even take my waders off. I drove in. The, the, first, the first thing you run beside and drive beside is a, there was used to be a bar right there on the river the river bank the river's edge and i got out got on the pay phone and called sykesville police and they answered the phone i told them what i saw uh, the woman who answered you know, I, I could tell she thought i was crazy but you know i didn't you know i told her i said well you know, what do you want me to do well, go back there and we'll have an officer meet you there well i'm thinking now why the hell would i want to go back there <laughs> You know, this thing is there, you know, but I said, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and drive back. And, you know, it was only like a three minute drive from there. So I got in the car and I drove right back up. You know, I should have stopped the bar. I got a couple of drinks first, but I, did. <laughs> I got it back in my car and I drove back up 
And by the time I got there, there was a Maryland State Police officer already there with one of those wood, long wooden barriers they used to have across the road. Hmm. And I pulled up and I rolled my window down, told the cop, I said, you know, I called in a report. He said, you got to leave. I said, but I called in. They said, and they told me to come here and meet you. No, you got to leave. Get out of here. Okay. He wouldn't say anything else. Wow. So I went ahead and backed up and turned around. And I went home. And like I said, I lived in Sykesville at the time. I sat at home for like an hour. So I went and had changed clothes and everything. And uh, about an hour later, I figured, well, look, I'm driving back up there to see what's going on. So I drove back. And when I got up there, about a quarter of a mile away from where I had had the encounter, it was just cars lined up and down the road. And uh, I had to walk, park on the side of the road and walk up. And the barrier's still there, but then there's a Howard County cop there. You know, I asked him, I just act, acted stupid. You know, I asked him, I said, what's going on? And he kind of laughed. He said, well, somebody said they saw a Bigfoot. I said, really? Yeah. Hmm. And I'm telling you, it was interesting because they had people with dogs going all through the weeds and the woods. It must have been a dozen of them. It was ridiculous. They had a big white tent set up there on the other side of the bank where I had seen this thing. There were jurisdictional police officers from every jurisdiction, all, you know, Howard County, Maryland State Police. Um, I think Carroll County Sheriff was there. They were, they were all there. Then they had two black wagoneers, which is what the feds used to drive back then. So I, you know, I recognized that was the, these were federals, what they were doing there. I had no idea. And I did hear a helicopter, didn't see one, but I heard one. Wow. It's crazy. I mean, there's other people there, you know, standing there talking. And I thought, well, I'm getting out of here. So I went ahead and walked back to my car and drove home. So when I got home, I called the three TV stations in Baltimore, uh, the three network stations. And I, uh, I told them what happened. And all three of them said, oh, yeah, we're interested. Let's get back. We'll get back to you in about two days. And then we'll do an interview. You know, we're going to make some inquiries and find out what happened. Okay. I thought we're well, great. So, I, you know, I didn't say much to anybody. I just kept it kind of to myself. I was watching the news, see if anybody had said anything, but I didn't see anything. So about a week later, I haven't gotten a call yet. So I called the news editor at MAR, and he wouldn't talk to me. Hmm. I said, well, look, I talked to you or to somebody else about a week ago when this happened. I don't even want to talk to you. And he hung up on me. So, you know, that was my first experience with Bigfoot. My only experience with Bigfoot. But all this cover-up stuff was involved with it. And the feds and the local jurisdictions. And also, you know, a, a couple of years later, I had mentioned something to uh, one of the investigators, the BFRO, Mike Frizzle. I don't know if you knew Mike is. He used to do, look into Carroll County, and he talked to one of the cops in Sykesville who had known about this. And because there's no record in the, you know, the police department had never kept any records of this. Mm -hmm. but anyway, he knew about it, and he called me, and he uh, he acknowledged it. Huh. He acknowledged it, and uh, he said, yeah, everything you, you know, that Mike said, you know, it's true. You know, ever since then, and that's been, what, 40, 41 years now? It's hard to believe it's been that long. But, um, yeah, I, I, I occasionally get somebody who will talk to me about seeing things in that area. You had mentioned to me earlier about other sightings. Well, of course, there was the, the Sykesville monster sightings back in the early 70s, uh, just after the Agnes flood. Mm -hmm. People were seeing this thing down in the uh, down in Sykesville along the river. Now, that community in Sykesville was an Afri African-American uh, community. I got to interview a lot of those people later on after I started showing interest in this because the guy I worked with, his family lived down there. 
So I got to talk to some of the actual witnesses, plus a few other ones. You know, when the, when the sightings first happened, the, the folks who lived down there contacted the um, Baltimore Afro-American newspaper. And they did the initial investigation. Then some of the other you know, networks and, and uh, media were picking up on it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I kept that fresh in my mind for a long time. And then, of course, I've had other people who have contacted me about sightings. Uh, I had one down in Daniels about four or five years ago. And that's an area just south of there. And of course, you were talking about with me about uh, around Liberty Dam. And they had had a couple sightings, Class A sightings, actually, at, at Liberty Reservoir and, and two more just below the dam. Hmm. So that whole area... And that, that's all part of Patapsco State Park. That whole area has been well known for Bigfoot sightings. Now, it's probably not as much now because a lot of it's really built off. But back then, you know, it was pretty, pretty thick with forest. And in fact, you know, I don't know if any, how many people know this, but that McKeldon area there, just north of Marriott'sville, was where they actually shot the Blair Witch movie at. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, look, there's been a lot of weird stuff that's happened in that state park. I mean, UFO activity, Bigfoot, a lot of weird things. That was my Bigfoot encounter. I have Missing Time at, uh, you know, where Soldier's Delight is? Mm-hmm. I have Missing Time there. Really? Yeah, my wife, then girlfriend, and I went in the woods there during the day, bright daylight, just walked into the woods, found a... Basically, I guess what would be a fairy circle in the middle of the woods is just the the woods cleared out in a perfect circle and the sun's hitting this place. And we sat down and spent some time there. And it didn't seem like we were there for that long. And then all of a sudden it's dark. Mm -hmm. And we came out of there and we were supposed to meet someone at 9. By the time we came out of those woods, it was after 10 p.m. Like I said, it was daylight when we went in, so I don't know what happened there. While we were there, a doe came up and walked around that circle. Like I, I, I could reach out and touch it and walked around really? us three times and then off into the woods, no adult deer with it, and then, or actually it was a little fawn. It was, it was very young deer. And then... Mm -hmm. When we walked out of there, like I said, it was, and I don't know what happened to that time. It's just, it's just gone. We went in during the day and came out at 10 p.m. You know, that Soldier's Delight area, it, it's actually well known for having an ecology that's like nothing like it in the world. Hmm. It's got a serpentine type rock formations there. And there's actually, I think, two plants that have been identified that only grow there. Interesting. Yeah, and actually, you know, the rock face or the rocks that go down off of that, off the road, I guess that's what road that is. I forget what I, road I can't that remember. Is. I, yeah, yeah it, you know, it might be Nicodemus Road, but I'm not sure. But anyway, from Soldier Delight down over the slope down to the lake, that's where one of the Bigfoot were sighted. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, when I lived in Randallstown, I was only like two and a half miles from that, so I was over there a lot. It, yeah, there's been a lot of weird stuff that's been <laughs> that's been reported around there for years. But yeah, I kicked around Liberty Reservoir when I was a kid a lot. Mm -hmm. cause I didn't live near there. I lived on out f further north. But my friends, I went to school in Ricerstown. All my friends lived there, so we, you know, spent a bunch of time in there. The only thing for me, the only thing weird that ever happened there was that at Soldiers Delight there that day, and that was really weird. Like. Mm -hmm. I think about that, I'm like, I don't know what happened to that time. It's just not there. <laughs> yeah, it is an odd place. It really is. But, I don't know, you know, the Bigfoot sightings definitely do happen there. They do happen around that area. You know, that's kind of where it all kicked off for me. I really started getting into cryptids at that point. You know, as time went by... I was, uh, you know, I was doing a case here and there, n nothing major, because I wasn't publishing anything. I just kept a lot of notes. Mm -hmm. But there were a few people, people I had gone to school with up here in Pennsylvania knew what I was doing and such. So anyway, one October day in 1988, I was at the Timonium Fairgrounds down just north of Baltimore. And there was some type of Boy Scout 
Jamboree or Boy Scout event going on there. Well, anyway, some of the, the troops from Pennsylvania, Adams in York County were down there. And it just so happens I ran into a guy I was in Boy Scouts with. Well, he and I went to school together, too. And he was a scoutmaster. And we hadn't seen each other for over a dozen years, I think. So um, we just sat down and started talking. But he knew about me doing the paranormal stuff. And in fact, when we were kids, we used to spend time out on the battlefield at night. You know, we'd sneak on the battlefield, even though they didn't really bother you back then. Mm -hmm. uh, you could you could go on there in a tent and they wouldn't do anything about it. You can't go on there now, but they, oh, they no. back then they did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They, so uh, they, they want you off at either nine or I think it's is it nine or ten p.m. I don't. They I don't want know. you out at dusk. I mean, they, yeah. it starts looking like it's getting dark. They want you out of there. Yeah, yeah. Those rangers are adamant about it too. I've seen them. I've seen them tear up a couple people for sticking around too long. So um, yeah, yeah I, I mean, can you imagine what they have to deal with with the? Oh, what well, they do. Yeah, the ghost and hunting it, industry there. Well, not only that. You know, when this COVID stuff was bad, those guys were getting, you know, guys and gals were getting sick left and right. Mm. You know, they just couldn't keep healthy. I do give them a lot of credit because they're very good. You know, their tours are excellent and everything, and they, they do provide a great service. Oh, yeah, they really are. People don't realize, I mean, we're so lucky that we live so close together. Absolutely. If you're interested in the paranormal and you're interested in history, which, you know, I know we both are. Yeah. It's just a treasure to be this close to it. Yeah, it is. I do like, still like going down there once in a while. It seems like, it, and they do keep up with the battlefield. There's always seems something different there mm -hmm. that they've changed up or renovated and such. So, yeah, I like to keep up with it. So anyway, I met my buddy. I mean, we were down at Timonium, and he, he we were talking. He knew I we had done the paranormal stuff. He and I had had some encounters when we were younger. He said, you're still doing the paranormal stuff. I said, yeah, yeah, I am. He said, well, look, me and another guy are going next weekend. We're going to be spending, we're going up there on Friday. We're going to spend the weekend up at Camp Conewago. Now, Camp Conewago is an old Boy Scout camp. I mean, it's been around for over a hundred years. I don't, I don't know exactly how old it is, but it, you know, you look pictures at it today of it today. It looks exactly like it did when I was a kid. Mm. I mean, not much has really changed. But anyway, he said he and the other guy were going up there because they were going to investigate all these screams that were coming out of the woods and scaring off campers all through the summer. I said, okay. I said, well, what did they sound? They said, I don't know. They said we had a couple, you know, we had a um, a jamboree up there that summer, and like five or six of the the troops pulled out and left out of there because the kids were scared. They were hearing these screaming sounds. So okay, so you know, I'm thinking, well, you know, I go up there and with them. So I said, yeah, I'll meet you up there. You know, this was a time back in 88 when I had mine sleeping on the ground. I couldn't do it now because I'd never get up. <laughs> but, yeah, so we went ahead and um, they brought the tents and everything. So I met him up there. It was on a Friday, uh, I don't know, about mid-afternoon the Friday. Uh, it, was, it was late uh, October. We hiked back into the woods. We weren't really too far from where the, uh, the two branches converse there. And, of course... There's a trail along, runs right along the creek, but we came in through the wood side. So uh, we set up in an area I was familiar with. I used to camp there all the time. And uh, we got our three tents up and uh, had a fire going by the time it turned dark. And we just spent the night, you know, talking and you know, football and other stuff and kind of catching up. This other guy was a friend. Of he, he was another scoutmaster from another troop. So we got to talk and meet him. But anyway, that night was pretty uneventful. I mean, it was the only thing that happened was when we went into the tents to sleep, I had heard, well, all of us had heard some walking around in the campsite. <clears throat> and that next morning, the other guy said something about and asked us, did you hear anything in it, like some, something walking around the campsite? 
And I did. I mean, something walked past my tent. I thought it was one of those guys getting up to relieve themselves in the woods. But I didn't think much of it. You know, we looked around and nothing was taken or nothing was disturbed. So I thought, well, maybe it was just a deer or something. I don't know. There's a lot of wildlife in there. So, um, you know, we got up, made our breakfast and everything. We decided we were going to spend most of the day hiking through the woods. And that's what we did. You know, we started hiking around. You know, you're talking about, you mentioned that uh, state game land. It, I think we actually walked up that far. We were actually out there about six hours. And when we got back, it was just starting to turn dark. You know, we sat down, made some something to eat, sitting there talking. We weren't drinking, uh, you know. Uh, coffee was the strongest thing we were drinking the whole time. And, you know, nothing was going on. But I tell you, I did have a sense that something was there or something was watching us. It was a weird feeling. I couldn't quite describe it. But, you know, everybody gets that little intuition like, well, you know, something's not right about being here. Mm -hmm. I didn't say much. So we were sitting there, and I guess about 11 o'clock, I guess we were just about ready to turn in. We heard this screaming sound. It was coming from the west of us in the deeper part of the woods. You know, it wasn't really loud, but, you know, it could have been an animal. It could have been, you know, deer scream and rabbit scream and all kinds of animals make crazy sounds. I didn't know what it was, but I didn't really think it was anything unusual. I thought it was just natural. So we just said, well, you know, we'll stay up a little bit and see what else happens if we hear anything else. Well, about an hour and a half later, I was up walking around, just stretching my legs and such, and then we heard it again. And this time, it sounded like a woman screaming, quite honest with you, or a child. Mm -hmm. It was kind of blood curling, honestly. I can imagine if it was a bunch of kids that would have scared the living daylights out of them. But it sounded like it was kind of moving in and out, like this thing was flying or running around real quickly. We didn't see anything. So uh, I walked out onto the trail. I was thinking, you know, I went back and told them, I said, you know, I, I don't know. Why don't we take our flashlights and go out on the trail, walk up and down a bit? You know, it's, it's almost, I think it was like one o'clock in the morning by then. So they decided, yeah, we weren't doing anything else. Maybe we, we'll see this thing. So, <laughs> so we got on the trail and we started heading west and we didn't get more than 50 foot away from the camp when we looked to the right into the creek. And if, at, at that time, the creek was really low. We looked in the middle of the creek, and something was standing in the middle of the creek. And we saw these big red eyes. And by the time we got the flashlight on this thing, it suddenly jettisoned itself up into the air. We didn't see any wings unfurl or anything. It just, and you heard a whooshing sound. This thing just went up into the air, got to an apex, and started screaming wow. and took off. So, um... You know, we're kind of half running back to the campsite, not knowing what the hell we saw. My buddy isn't talking. He's sitting there. He didn't say a word. The other guy asked me, said, did you see something on its back? And I did. It looked like there were wings on its back. Uh, it looked like the wings kind of extended up over the head, but I never saw anything you know, come, become unfurled. Mm -hmm. Nothing ever opened up. When this thing took off, it took right off. So... Uh, you know, we tried to prod my buddy into talking. He said, I'm not sticking around here. He said, I'm going up the administration building. Oh, hmm. uh, okay. Well, I wanted to see what it was. So those two went up the administration building and spent the night. I stayed up the rest of the night, but nothing else. I never heard anything or saw anything the rest of that night. I didn't know what the hell we saw, but I was pretty sure that it, it was something, it was a flying being of some type. It, had, it was dark in color. Uh, it was about maybe six foot in height and these red eyes. And they, they just weren't like reflections. They were like out putting out light. Self-illuminating, yeah. Self-illuminating. Yeah. And it was the damnest thing. So that was 88. And I didn't really talk a whole lot about it. I mentioned it to a few people. So when I started uh, writing, I was writing for a website called East Ghost 
starting back in um, 2004. Eventually, I started Phantoms and Monsters back in 2005. And I still didn't write about it. I was writing about a lot of other investigations and stuff or new news that would come up. But I guess around 2007, 2008, I eventually wrote about it. I called it the Conawaga Phantom. And when I did write about it, I eventually got some emails from people. One guy over Dick's Dam contacted me. He said, you know, I've been hearing that screaming sound for 20 years now, and I still don't know what the heck it is. Wow. And then uh, about a week later, I got another email from a scoutmaster who had just been out there a couple of weeks previous with his troop. And he said that uh, now they were they were camping up closer to on the trail, but up closer to the administration building, that big lot as you drive in there. Mm-hmm. And he said, you know, something happened a couple of weeks ago with my troop. We were up at Conawaga. And the kids were just out walking up and down the trails, you know, the kids are. And they, about, about a, a bit later, they came running back, all excited, saying that they saw a dragon. And okay. Well, he said, I thought they were pulling my leg. He said, I never even imagined something like that being out there. And I just thought they were trying, you know, he said, but they did act serious. He said, now, they didn't hear anything. They didn't see anything the rest of the time they were out there. The kids wouldn't go back up the trail, though, for the mm-hmm. other two days they were there. He said, now, if I read what you had encountered, maybe it was that. So it was strange. So in the subsequent years, I've had five other sightings of a very similar creature. Uh, and some people have actually seen it fly. Mm-hmm along the Conewago Creek. Now, I'm not. I'm talking mostly downstream from, from there. Um, Hampton, just north of Dover, uh, out by the, um, not, not too far from uh, where it empties into Susquehanna. And there was another area, too. But, uh, yeah, uh, people have seen it. Now, I don't think I had, I don't think I had a report for about four years now. But, uh, you know, it makes me think. It's interesting that, this thing that we encountered out there in Conewago was very similar in the description of what we've been getting out in Chicago. Yeah. Now, why that's happening, I don't know. If it's the same type of species, if I've been, it, it's something where I've been imprinted on something, or it, it was like a preview of what I was going to be encountering or investigating. Oh, I, I didn't even I, think of it like that. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I never, you know, I talked to Tobias and Manuel about this. And I said, you know, these sightings are so similar to what we encountered. I mean, it's so eerie, even down to the scream. I mean, some people in, in Chicago have, have likened the scream to railroad car brakes screeching on the rails. Mm-hmm. It's that loud and that shrill. You know, it is unusual. And, you know, we've also had other sightings of these winged beings in, in Adams County and in York County. Yeah, so that was that was my winged being slash Mothman encounter. I don't know uh, what it was, but uh, I do believe it's something very similar to what is being seen out in the Chicagoland area. Yeah, yeah, it's so interesting. And, it, and it's interesting how you can almost follow those reports along the Conewago Creek like yeah. one after another. It's, you can almost do a timeline as it heads out along the creek. Yeah. Not, not quite, but almost. It's really, really interesting that whatever it is seems to follow the Conewago. Yeah, all the sightings have been along the Conewago. Uh, the only one that wasn't right by the creek but was very near there was a farmer who saw something standing out in, in the field. He didn't see the eyes, but he said it was like a black wing being standing out there. He was only like a couple hundred yards from the creek. Yeah, and the one you had gotten this report for Phantoms and Monsters, it was uh, near Cador's Furnace. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that woman and her mother had to encounter this yep. whole thing in the back of the car. Yeah, yeah. then they called it their Mothman sighting, and you sent it to me because you know that's like the area. I do right. a lot of work there. and then But I said, hey, Lon, you know, that's in between the Cador's and the Conewago Creeks there. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's exactly. right in between them. So, yeah, even that one. So, yeah, that's there's a lot in a little area, you know? Yeah. And 
Not as many as Chicago, obviously. No, but no. A lot less population here, you know. And I guess the other the other places around this area where we had the so we had one just north of Lancaster, and we had one down Littlestown. Oh, really? I don't know if I heard about the Littlestown. Oh yeah, the pink one. Yeah, this. Oh yeah, the one Littlestown. I had to dig it out and give it to you. It was right off a golf course, just south of Littlestown, really close to the Maryland line. This family were out driving. I guess it was a Sunday. I don't know what day it was. But anyway, this thing crossed in front of them. And, and it was on, the, on its legs. But it was a winged being on legs that was kind of pinkish in color. Wow. Yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah, that's a weird <laughs> Yeah. We're kind of lucky to be in an area like this because we every once in a while we hear something really weird. Mm-hmm. Of course, you know, we had that sighting, I think the, the one in New Oxford or whatever, that what people saw walking around in New Oxford that may have been a cryptid, a canine cryptid. Oh, and then, yeah. The, yeah. then the other thing, the size of a cow up by Shippensburg that the garbage truck driver saw. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But <laughs> we do get some pretty decent sightings around here. So Chad and I have been spending some time at Kadura State Park. Right. And I know you have a pretty interesting, I guess it was a ghost encounter out near there. Yeah. Oh, God. This was out by the dam. Mm-hmm. Now, this was, what year was this? Was it 76 or 77? I had just moved down to Maryland. And I had got a call from a guy who worked for Gladfelder at the time. And he was work. He worked at the dam, and right there, where you know they had the, all those trees and stuff they had grown in there. And he was telling me that he was seeing this blue mist above the trees that just looked really weird. He didn't know what it was, but you know, but I come down and look at it. So I said, yeah. So I, you know, I met him down. He was right there at Huff Road or the access road that goes back to the dam. Mm-hmm. So he had keys to the, he had keys to the gate. So it was him and two other guys. So we were all four were in my car and we drove down to the dam. We got out, started walking around. I used to go deer hunting down there a lot. So I knew the area pretty well, but there was a, uh, the one thing that really freaked me out was, there was an old maple or oak tree that was, and it was old too. It had huge boughs on it. Uh, it was right there, like in a little clearing right by the the creek uh, in between all those trees. And uh, I had a really bad feeling. You know, it reminded me of a lynching tree. It hmm. really did. You know, this was the area where he was seeing all this blue mist at. So we're sloshing around it because it's way really boggy and everything. And it's cold. It's in February. I don't know what it was. It just hadn't gotten that cold that all the stuff hadn't frozen up. But I know by the time we were done looking around about three or four hours, we were really cold and tired. So we walked back up on the access road and got in the car, turned the heat on, had some coffee. We're drinking it. Yeah, I actually forget what time of night it was. I, I think I wrote it down. But anyway, we're sitting there in the car and we've been in there for about 15, 20 minutes. And I turned the lights on because I thought I saw something walking up in front of us. I didn't know what I thought maybe it was a deer. So I turned the lights on and I saw something maybe, I don't know, 100 foot in front of us. It was kind of hazy that night anyway. So I told, I said, look at that. And uh, they all looked at it. We were watching this thing and it was walking our way. And I'm looking and this humanoid-like thing was walking up the road, and it was full body too. As it got closer, I recognized it was a a mulatto or black woman who her shirt was opened up, her breast you could see her breast, and she was shaking and swaying her head back and forth, and. She got pretty close to the car. I mean, she got, I guess, within 50 feet of the car. And she stopped, and she was shaking her head violently. These guys in the car are freaking. I mean, they're they're going nuts on me. I tried to get them to hush down. And then 
she turned around slowly, walked a couple steps, and disappeared. Mm. So um, the clothes were tattered clothes, but they, I mean, they were 19th century. I mean, it was uh, it was nothing fancy. They were just like, you know, it was old tattered shirt, tattered. I don't know. She had a real long tattered skirt on. Yeah, it was really bizarre. That really left an impression on me. I um, so I of course I had to do some research, and as I found out later on, of course this part of the country uh, was part of the uh, Underground Railroad, mm-hmm. and oh, yeah. uh, a lot of fugitive slaves came up through here. Oh yeah, and I think the slave hunters may have killed her. I think they grabbed her somewhere. I think it has something to do with that tree. Hmm. You know, I am intuitive, but I just got a bad feeling around that tree. So by me being around that tree, did it cause her to manifest in front of us somehow? I don't know. But, you know, where she did walk was walking up the road. That was about maybe 200 yards away from the tree. I don't, I don't know what that was. You know, I just called her the slave woman of Marburg. Yeah. Yeah, for people who don't know it, I think Chad and I have mentioned this a few times. The town of Marburg is under the the water there, mm-hmm. which I think probably makes for some weird energy. You know, the the area has always had some weird energy anyway. There is a cemetery down there, mm-hmm. at least one cemetery, and there was a church and a few other things. And I, I remember when they built the place, it was in 1970, in fact, they called it Project 70. Yep, yeah, and a lot of and people around here still call it, they won't they call it Doors State They still call it Project 70, yep. absolutely. Yeah, they call it Project 70, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, I, you know, I, I was kind of young yet, but I didn't really know a whole lot what was going on, but I know my dad was telling me that it was Marburg, it was another small town, and they moved the people out, but they, they never tore the buildings down, they never uh, moved the cemetery. They never did nothing. And they just let it fill up after they built the dam. <laughs> yeah. That, well, I tell you, I've had a lot of hauntings around that lake. Mm-hmm. People calling me to look at their, you know, at their homes mm-hmm. for hauntings and weird energy. So I don't know if it has anything to do with it or not. Um, you know, I used to hunt those woods when I was a kid. Because my aunt and uncle had a farm there, and right there, just above the dam, up on Huff Road. And I never noticed anything at all when I was a kid. But I don't know if I'd go back there now. Hmm. I really don't. There's just a lot of weird stuff that people see. Yeah, last time we were there, we were catching, I don't know whether they just call it just orbs or UFOs or what they are, but they're on the other side, not the dam side, the other side. Mm-hmm. And we just repeatedly saw them. I, we saw four or five right. that night, and they weren't planes because you could see planes and you could see the you know the lights blinking on the planes. These were and these were low over the trees. They, they were big, just one after another. You know, we'd see one, and then we'd see another one, and we we say, hey, "Is that a plane?" And then we'd look at it. No, it's not a plane because they, they would bounce. They would do you know they move weird ways that planes don't. So I don't know what those are, but that's what we keep seeing there. My uh, my great grandfather and great grandmother had a house down there, right there along the, the old access along the access road, just down from the dam, about 150 yards down from the dam. Uh, I don't know how much uh, house is left. It's a pretty good sized house, mm-hmm. but when they left, it just you know it just went to uh, you know it was left to go, and they sold the property to a PH Gladfelder and they owned the property. But, you know, when I was a kid, we used to, we used to go down there. My mother and all, cause my mother basically was raised. My mother was born and raised down in Porters. So, you know, that's the area she lived down. Of course, my aunt and uncle lived there, and I uh, had a lot of relatives. My grandfather's siblings and stuff were still living around the area. But uh, that was a creepy old house. <laughs> it really was. I, I never really got a good feel for it. <laughs> so uh, I don't know how much of it. I haven't been down there in Oh my God, I don't think I've been down there in 35 years. So um, I don't know how much of it is left. Yeah, yeah. So I think time has kind of vindicated people on this. But I know back in the day, even even 15 years ago in the paranormal, mm-hmm. if you experienced multiple things, right? If you were somebody who saw Bigfoot and saw a ghost and, you know, maybe at different times, 
you know, had another experience or saw a UFO too as well, etc. People would start doubting you because, oh, you can't, you know, these multiple experiences, you'd be immediately held in doubt. And it's changed now, thankfully. I think yeah. I think because enough people like us are talking about it, like, no, this happens. Like people, we do have these re- people with repeat encounters. Mm-hmm. But back in the day, like, you know, like I said, did you take uh, some some flack for that, for being a multiple experiencer? Well, you know, I, I just never talked about it. Mm. Uh, you know, I had a few friends who knew about it, but I just didn't really say much about it until uh, I actually started writing about it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting. The, the two guys that were with me with the Mothman or the winged humanoid sighting, both have passed away. Hmm. Yeah. And, I mean, they were my age. Yeah, they, but they passed years ago. Uh, one was in a, an auto accident and the other one had cancer. Died not long after it happened. But, no, I didn't really say a whole lot about it. I never really talked about it. Just people who I was close with. I mean, I did scare a hell out of a girlfriend one time. We were down at... Uh, Low Dutch Cemetery of Bonneville. You know where that's at? Hmm, I'm not sure. Old cemetery down there, off the off, just just east of Gettysburg, but closer to Bonneville. Okay. And <laughs> we were sitting out there in my car, and pulled off the road, and I, you know, she was kind of wondering why the hell we were sitting there at the cemetery. And I don't know, I just had a feeling we should be there for whatever reason. But something, I don't know what came, but something banged on the, the hood of the car. We never saw anything. Yeah, her and I didn't go out after that. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty strange. You know, that, that Low Dutch Cemetery has always been well known for a lot of activity. You may want to check it out one day. I, I guess it's still there. Yeah, it sounds but, familiar. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering there's a Low Dutch Road. Okay. That comes off 116, I believe. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's, it, if you go along that road, you'll, you'll see the cemetery. Okay, I'm pretty sure I, I, I know the area, but I've not, I've yeah. not been to the cemetery, I don't think, no. But I'll tell you, you know, Gettysburg is so, and you and I have talked about it on my show, just like with the, uh, you know, like the Cover Bridge and or Saks and a few other places, just off the battlefield itself. You got a lot of hauntings and a lot of weird stuff. Oh, yeah. You know? We've had Bigfoot sightings on the battlefield, mm-hmm. UFO sightings. I was out there in November. Was it November? Late October last year with uh, a couple of people on the team. And Tommy, he uh, he took a picture of something. And I swear it looked like a canine, a huge canine in the woods. Wow. So I don't know what the hell that was. So you do see a lot of weird stuff out there. Oh, heck yeah. We'll have to get yeah. into the canines in a future show. Lon, yeah. are your books on Amazon? They're all on Amazon. Just put Lon Strickler and then search and they'll all come up. And phantomsandmonsters.com. And what's your radio? Phantoms and Monsters Radio. Search that on YouTube and you'll find that. Or on every Friday night and some Wednesday nights where we run special shows. Awesome. Lon, thanks so much for coming on Strange Familiars. Thanks again, Tim. Can you guess what the curiosity of the week is, Allison? No, I'd need to be clairvoyant to do that. Well, you should probably read it then. It's called Adventures in ESP, Clairvoyance, the Sense of Psychic Sight. That actually would have been really interesting to me, particularly when I was a kid, because I read somewhere that you could develop ESP. So I made myself like makeshift cards with like the the triangle, the triangle, the, wave. the circle. The is it a square and a wave? I think so. Yeah. And I would practice. Did you get any good? No. <laughs> See now, I don't know why. I had seen that on a TV show or something. Yeah, maybe that's where I saw it. And I guess I just assumed that I wouldn't have enough symbols or whatever, so I didn't think to make my own up. That would have been totally in my wheelhouse. I was always trying to, like, because my parents would never buy me anything. (laughs) Yeah, you had to make it. (laughs) I was always trying to make stuff. Like, I remember I tried to make, like, the bat signal with a flashlight and a cutout of a bat on it. Couldn't get it to work. Very disappointing. That could be because flashlights don't tend to have the... uh... I mean, I wasn't trying to shine it off the clouds, but I felt, thought maybe I could get the bat signal on uh, the off wall. a closet. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I couldn't make it work. But in any case, this 
is an interesting little booklet we came upon in our travels. It's published by Astara. Mm-hmm. 1965. Looks like it was self-published. I'm guessing Astara is uh, the oh. author's own company here. It's about how to develop ESP and clairvoyance. X-ray clairvoyance. The ability to see through material substance and behold what lies within or on the other side. It is particularly significant if possessed by a healer, for it enables him to discern causes concerning the illness of his patients. So it's like making yourself your own MRI machine. Exactly. I would rather go to one of those guys than be in an MRI for three hours. So I'm not sure how rare this is. You looked it up and you found different copies of this publication, but not this specific copy. And actually this cover is cooler than the other ones. Yeah, this is a, it's a pretty neat cover. You know what? I'll put an image of this in the show notes at strangefamiliars.com. If you click on that, it'll take you to our Etsy shop where you can purchase this and other curiosities of the week, those that we have left. And then you'll know what the topic is for next week, probably before we do. Ah, because of the ESP. <laughs> and then you could tell us, I mean, and then that would really help exactly us come up with a show. That would help us. That would help a lot. Have a psychic on call. we just like, hey. What's the show for the okay. week? <laughs> What's next week's show going to be? While you're at Etsy, check out our other offerings, T-shirts. We have the traditional blue Strange Familiars Awoken Tree T-shirt, as well as Glow in the Dark. I think we have all sizes, small through 3X in both of those right now. Copies of my books are there. They come signed when you order them from our Etsy. You don't even have to ask. Artwork, originals and prints. Allison has plenty of antique photos up there. Strange Familiars stickers, patches, and more. Go ahead and check it out. Our Etsy shop name is Lost Grave, but if you type in Strange Familiars, our stuff should pop up. It is November, so if you're ordering for the holidays, you might not want to wait too long. Plus, if you order uh, one size larger, it's perfect to wear for Thanksgiving. Ah, yeah. So get those holiday orders in early, and we can get your wonderful Strange Familiar stuff out so you can give to friends and families and help us with the podcast as well. Hey, speaking of podcasts, Allison. Yeah? I'm doing a new one. It's called The Flowered Path. If you are subscribed to our feed, you probably saw the first episode come up in the Strange Familiars feed. I just want to mention it again. Strange Familiars isn't going anywhere. No intention of stopping Strange Familiars. I love this podcast. I've said several times. I'm where and this I'm, is your firstborn baby. Yeah. I'm where I need to be. Yeah. I am where I need to be. I'm where I'm supposed to be with Strange Familiars. But I was reading about these saints, and I'm already writing books, and I'm already doing this podcast. And I could have kind of crowbarred the saint stuff into Strange Familiars, mm -hmm. but I thought, you know what, why don't I take this information and make another podcast? We're starting off with the first three or four episodes are going to be weekly, but after that, it's probably going to be every other week. So the flower path will always be in, in addition to, as opposed to in lieu of. That's the plan. That's absolutely the plan. You know, I've been an author before I was a podcaster, I've continued writing books and Strange Familiars at the same time. I was an illustrator. Before I was a podcaster, I continued illustrating and doing Strange Familiars at the same time. I was a musician. Before I was a podcaster, I've continued making music and doing Strange Familiars at the same time. This is just another creative thing I'm doing. I'm super excited about it, but it's different. It's different than Strange Familiars. Episodes are like, some of them are very short. I think the second episode was like less than 15 minutes long. It was like 14 minutes long. Some episodes are going to be over an hour, everywhere in between, so there's not the consistency of the episode length like Strange Familiars has. I hope there's a lot of crossover and people will be interested because there's a lot of... Woo! With the saints, there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a lot of uh, miracles, there's a lot of strange stuff, there's a lot of... Apparitions. Apparitions and bilocation and all kinds of very, very strange things of people uh, coming back from the dead and so forth. And if not, it's just like, I heard it the other night, and there's a lot of ASMR quality to just sitting there listening to you very methodically reading through what Read, you've written about the saints, in a, very, the saints. in a very whispery kind of like, <laughs> but serious tone. It's... <laughs> well, hopefully there's some crossover interest. One thing you could do, and this is for both podcasts, for Strange Familiars and The Flowered Path, if you could like and subscribe wherever you're listening, whether it's on Stitcher or Apple Podcasts, or YouTube, or Amazon Music, wherever you're listening to podcasts. Follow us wherever you listen. There's two episodes of The Flowered Path out now. Like I said, I think the next one or two 
will probably be weekly. After that, the schedule will slow down a little bit. You can also find that at thefloweredpath.com. All right. Any other news, Allison? No, I don't have any other news in the world. All right. I guess that's it. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll be back soon with more Strange Familiars. Strange Familiars is a production of Dark Holler Arts, music, books, art, podcasts, and more. Intro and background music is by Stone Breath. If you want to hear more or purchase music by Stone Breath, you can go to stonebreath.bandcamp.com. Strange Familiars is on Facebook, facebook.com slash strangefamiliars. We're on Instagram, at strangefamiliars, one word. And you can find us on the web at strangefamiliars.com. Tree.